on this freezing cold evening, everybody, welcome. Um, except that we're probably all sitting in the comfort of our homes instead of having to trek out in the cold into the west end of Glasgow. Um, the reason for this is that we've we've had some uh, problems with uh, two of the venues that we could possibly uh, have the meeting in this evening, partly to do with um, sort of communications to the wider world through Zoom. Um, but we're on our way to, to fixing them. Um, and uh, that kind of uh, leads me via a kind of radio to link to um, the fact that the next at least two meetings uh, we will have face to face again will be in the Kelvin Hall rather than the Boyd Hall, which has the advantage that we have a, a social space um, after after the meeting where we can hang around and have tea. And uh, if you want to bring anything to show everybody, then that's the time to do it. Um, uh, so that's 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 a kind of um, at least a trial. Uh, just to, just to see how it works out. So we've got a couple of things to sort out before then. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, that that's that's all the announcements basically. So um, I hope there's nobody queuing up outside the Boyd Hall this evening. Um, but next time, don't go to the Boyd Hall, go to the Kelvin Hall. But it'll all be made clear in the the, the relevant newsletter. So <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm very pleased, uh, delighted this evening to welcome um, Tony Galloway from St Andrews University for a number of reasons. The first one, of course, is that many of you will be aware that I have a fascination with planetary geology myself uh, and have trailed around the country to little astronomy or even big astronomy societies talking about Mars and Venus and that kind of thing. And this this is a new area linked to um the, the biological side of Mars, which is fascinating. But it's also very nice to welcome a PhD student. Uh, so somebody who's actually right at the forefront of brand new science that's going on. And, and that's great too. Um, so uh, uh, Tony um, actually has a, a background in biology and geology. Um, so we, we've got an interesting mixture of the two in, in some sort of astrobiology this evening. Um, and uh, she did a bachelor's degree at the University of St. Andrews, where she says that um, uh, she was one of the few locals in the university. She was probably surrounded by princes and kings and princesses and things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, um, and uh, during her undergraduate degree, she was introduced to the field of astrobiology, which is a real growing subject at the moment. Um, and 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 the study of analog environments uh, on Earth uh, through her supervisor Claire Cousins. So this this uh, interested her so much that she went back to St Andrews to work for her during a PhD. Um, but she's also spending part of her time in um, Manchester University learning about um, bioinformatics. Uh, so uh, sort of I guess that's the big data field that we now have uh, uh, sort of parallel methods in uh, what's becoming known as geoinformatics. Um, and uh, and there she's working with our secondary supervisor Sophie Nixon. Um, so so this evening uh, you should have the, the the title up there on your screen by now. Uh, Bio geochemical cycling. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Um, of Mars analogs. Uh, so Tony, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yep, you're nice and clear. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, that makes my introduction a lot easier. Um, yeah, I'm Tony. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of St Andrews, and I'm currently doing part of that PhD at the University of Manchester as well. Uh, just to get out of Fife for a little bit, uh, seeing as I'm also from there. Um, but yeah, um, I'm funded by the UK Space Agency, uh, and I'm focusing on as was mentioned, uh, biogeochemical cycling of Mars analogs. I can't just stick to one science, so this is what I do. Um, so a little bit about me, this is also mentioned in the bio, but I did my bachelor's at St Andrews in a uh, joint bachelor's in biology and geology. Uh, I graduated in 2020 in the middle of COVID, which was a lot of fun, uh, uh, I, where I met my supervisor, Dr Claire Cousins, uh, in my undergrad as well, who was me, my supervisor for my undergrad dissertation. Um, and then went back in 2021 to start a PhD. I'm currently in Manchester, um, but raring to get back to St Andrews to finish my PhD. Uh, and I work in the field of astrobiology. 
So a little introduction to astrobiology, just in case uh, you know, people aren't too familiar with the field. Um, so the blanket definition is the study of the origin, evolution and distribution of life across the universe. And this includes Earth as well. Uh, Earth is our only example so far of biology uh, and life appearing on a planetary body. So understanding how it appeared and how it survives on Earth is imperative before we look for life on other planets. So astrobiology is an interdisciplinary field. It encompasses a wide range of different scientific and non-scientific backgrounds, as you can see here. Um, I've been lucky enough, because I'm part of this field, to work with many scientists from a great many backgrounds. Um, and I feel that any sort of academic background is fit for astrobiology and could contribute to the field. Um, and they are constantly contributing and pushing it forward as well. So this is my introduction to astrobiology. This is what Claire showed me in a meeting during my undergrad, uh, which basically had me converted. I very nearly went down the paleontology route as a geobiologist. That was kind of the obvious um, route for me until Claire showed me this. Um, so this is drone footage and hopefully it should work. Yes, great. OK, so this is uh, Lost Hammer Spring on Axel Heiberg Island. This is in the Canadian Arctic, um, very, very cold right up in the north. Um, my colleague Mark is in the blue standing at the vent up there where the water is just coming up um, and the footage was taken by Gordon Nozinski who's in the black there with the drone. Um, so what's cool about this spring uh, for a, num or a number of reasons. Um, so where the water is coming up where Mark is standing there's almost no oxygen. Uh, the salinity is 22 to 26 percent which we consider quite hypersaline. Um, for context I think ocean water is a salinity of about three or four percent. Um, so all of that white stuff you see around the rim of the event is actually salt. It's not ice. Um, speaking of ice, the temperature of that water is a cosy minus 3.6 degrees Celsius. Um, the only reason it's still liquid or slushy in a way is because of the salinity. It's also incredibly sulfur rich, the waters themselves. And it's also the uh, coldest recorded methane seep on Earth. So, but what's so interesting about this spring is this site is an analogue. And it's an analog for Europa. Europa is a tiny, tiny icy moon which orbits Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. Jupiter has over 30 moons, but the four largest ones are called the Galilean moons, and Europa is one of these. When we first discovered Europa, it looked pretty boring. It was basically just a little ball of ice. Um, it wasn't until the Galileo missions uh, flew by where we noticed some interesting textures on the surface that led to the discovery of a subsurface ocean. Um, so here's a close-up of Europa's uh, uh, surface, and you can see the blue-green areas are just kind of water ice, but the red areas are uh, areas where the surface cracked. And these were really interesting because we were able to examine these from using instruments further away to figure out that these were sulfur salts which had been pushed up between the cracks uh, as the moon kind of flexes, which suggests that there, there is sulfur-rich material beneath, um, similar to Lost Hammer. Uh, we also measured the magnetic field of Europa, and that suggested that it contains a very, very salty ocean, also similar to Lost Hammer. And the distance from the sun means this moon is very, very cold. Um, the only reason that the water is still liquid is due to a combination of the salinity um, and also tidal heating from other moons passing by and basically squishing it and causing a little more uh, internal heat to be generated that way. But what is exceptionally cool is that Lost Hammer, back on Earth, contains life. It's dominated by microbes, so single-celled organisms, which can tolerate either high, like high salinities, which we call halophiles, as well as low temperatures, which we call psychrophiles. So if there's life in this spring, this incredibly extreme environment, what does this mean for Europa? So that's why there's a couple of missions that are currently headed or going to be heading that way. Um, the European Space Agency's JUICE mission, JUICE mission, that was harder to say than I expected, is uh, currently en route to study Jupiter's moons for signs of life, not just Europa, but the others too. And NASA is going to be launching Clipper later this year to study Europa for about four years as well, which is really, really cool. So as you can probably uh, guess, uh, analog environments are environments on Earth that are similar to environments on another planetary body. And they're environments that we can go to and study to understand those environments. So they tend to be quite extreme because of this. So they're very hard to live in unless you're a very tough microbe. Um, but study these, studying these environments can, on Earth can teach us about the limits of life elsewhere in the universe. 
So my current focus, uh, as you can probably guess in my title, is on Mars. I've moved away from icy moons and to an icy planet instead. Um, uh, my research is quite is quite relevant uh, right now, especially because of the Perseverance mission, which landed in 2020. On the right, you can see uh, a little uh, map showing where Percy has gone since landing in 2020. Each of these red points are a core sample that it has taken uh, as it goes along its way. Um, but what's exciting about this is that the current plans for Perseverance include eventual sample return to Earth. So those core samples it's taking right now will be returned to Earth in the next decade, hopefully, fingers crossed. The current plan, I believe, is to send a spacecraft into orbit around Mars to detach a small lander onto the surface, which will collect the cores and then take back up, connect the, uh, with the main spacecraft and pop back to Earth. Super easy. Um, but as you can see, uh, Percy so far moved across this beautiful delta um, and across another range of environments on Mars. And this return of these samples to Earth means that new analyses will be possible for the Mars samples that the rovers are currently incapable of doing. And this allows us for more thorough search for biosignatures, which are signs of life. Um, so uh, here's a quick history uh, of uh, both Earth and Mars. You can see on the right, uh, present day Earth is a lot more interesting than present day Mars. Um, Unlike us, Mars has lost its atmosphere, its magnetic field, any surface water, um, volcanism, hydrothermalism, and is not hit by meteorites anymore. So it's pretty dull. However, there is a period in uh, Mars's early history here called the Noachian period, where it had quite a few of the things that we would consider to be essential for life. So it had an atmosphere, although it was a little bit thin. Uh, it had uh, liquid water, hydrothermalism, volcanism, and meteorite bombardment. And this was along, around the same time that we think life was maybe first appearing on Earth as well. So we think that there were a lot of similarities between early Earth and early Mars. So that means that there might have been some really cool habitable environments on early Mars. And one of those environments is hot springs. Um, so this picture is kind of maybe an idea of what Mars would have looked like four billion years ago. We found mineralogical evidence for ancient hot springs on Mars um, that were active mainly during the Noachian period, which was 4.1 to 3.7 billion years ago. Um, due to the loss of tectonic activity on Mars in its early history, these deposits are still on the surface, somewhat preserved. Um, this is in comparison to, if I go back, um, Earth, where we don't have as many uh, rocks that, are that age because of our constant uh, tectonic activity and subduction of these whereas the Mars rocks are still there. So we can go to those deposits, maybe sample them, and I'm interested in what kind of signs of life would we expect to see in ancient hot spring deposits if simple life was there. So modern hot springs, I've got another video, which will hopefully work, um, kind of look a little bit more like this. Uh, so we have volcanic gases like CO2 and sulfide bubbling up through the waters. Uh, the water contains very little oxygen as it moves up, and it can be very hot and or very acidic, depending on what kind of elements it's leaching from the rocks and how much of those volcanic gases are uh, dissolved in that water. And there's also life in hot springs. There's actually very abundant life in hot springs, as you can see this absolutely prolific microbial uh, streamers in this uh, filling this uh, stream. Um, these can be either uh, thermophiles, which are heat lovers, or uh, acidophiles, which love acidic waters. And there's a huge diversity of life that we can find in hot springs on Earth. But I'm fo focused on where specifically we'd be able to find hot springs on Earth that are most similar to those on Mars. And so that's why I went to Iceland. Um, so Iceland has a remarkably similar geology to Mars. They're both mainly igneous rocks and mainly basaltic on top of that. Uh, it has high levels of volcanism. Um, another volcano literally just erupted this morning on Iceland. I've been watching a live stream of it all day. Um, uh, there's 32 active volcanoes in Iceland right now, I believe. Um, it has liquid war, which is always great for life. And it's super pretty, which is never a bad thing when you're going for field work. Um, it's also very barren. I didn't put that on here, but it's also very barren. Um, Iceland doesn't have a lot of natural fauna and flora. And so um, we have less of those multicellular organisms that we wouldn't expect to find in kind of early Earth or early Mars hot springs. So I went to Mars and 
sorry, Iceland, not Mars. Uh, I went to Iceland and pretended it was Mars. This is me with a little uh, spacesuit edit over me. Um, but I'm interested in a few main things when sampling. Um, so how the microbial communities cycle bioessential elements. So these are the chinops, which are the kind of elements we assume most life to need. Um, what geochemical factors impact these or either inhibit or favour them? And what kind of biosignatures they leave behind uh, after they are gone that we might look for in similar Martian deposits? So I went to Iceland. Here's a nice little map of, of, of the country. Um, the lines kind of show uh, uh, where the higher temperature geothermal systems are. Each of those dots is a different system. And I visited three high temperature uh, systems in Iceland. Uh, first, I visited Hengith, which is uh, mainly basaltic or tholeitic, and that's that middle one there. There were two systems uh, that I actually sampled within that, as there are three volcanoes attached to this one. Um, uh, one within the town of Fergerthi, uh, one just outside of it called Okotohals. I also went to Kristivik, which is down in the southwest. Um, an offshoot of Kristivik is actually what's erupting right now. And when I was there sampling, we actually felt earthquakes and it erupted um, five days before I went the first time and the day after I left the second time. So I have missed it erupting both times by a matter of days, which is unfortunate. Um, but this system is mainly basaltic and quite acidic hot springs. Um, and finally, Kurlingerfjall, which is up in the central highlands. That was where uh, my opening slide was. Um, it's uh, surrounded by uh, glacial deposits and is dominated by basaltic hyaloclastites underneath violet domes. So I use a combination of analyses to fully understand these analogue sites at both St Andrews and Manchester. Um, first was water geochemistry. So this involved just physical chemical measurements, so pH, temperature, other in situ measurements, um, just to give us a general idea. Then major ions, um, which are measured uh, using a couple of different methods, so uh, inductively coupled uh, plasma mass spectrometers or spectrophotometers. Um, which gave us kind of what the major uh, dissolved anions and cations were in the water. And finally, dissolved gases, which is just to test uh, how many of the, how much of the waters were dominated by volcanic gases versus atmospheric gases. And this just gives us a general idea of what the environment is like. And I did this at St Andrews. My second analysis that I also did at St Andrews was stabilised top measurements, which I'll go and explain a little bit more as well. And so I sampled uh, the stabilised topes, or measured the stabilised topes of the biomass, which is the microbes themselves, uh, the sediment, um, when we could separate the two, sometimes we couldn't, and the dissolved gases, and, and we measured these in relation to standards. And I wanted to see how biology was affecting these and if we could use them as biosignatures. Finally, and um, what I've been doing at Manchester is metagenomic analyses. Um, I am a biologist, so there is biology involved in astrobiology. Um, and this involves sequencing DNA of these organisms. DNA is basically uh, a manual for cells. It tells them what they're capable of doing. So if we read the DNA, it tells us what organisms are capable of doing. And that's the main questions I wanted to answer by looking at these. So I'm focusing mainly on the biological nitrogen cycle right now. So that's what I'll focus on for this talk today, but I am going to be considering other biogeochemical cycles like carbon, iron and sulfur as well. Um, so I've summarised it on the right here, um, and you can see the kind of different steps involved. Um, each step requires different metals uh, that, the, that the microbes need for their enzymes. Enzymes are kind of biological catalysts that help each of these reactions happen, and they tend to have a metal cofactor, which is where the reactions can take place. Um, I've put them in the top left there. Uh, there's uh, iron, molybdenum, copper and vanadium for the nitrogen cycle are uh, what are the main ones that are used. But the availability of these metals will impact which of these reactions are possible in certain environments. Um, it's worth noting that the nitrogen cycle is bottlenecked by nitrogen fixation, which is in the top right, the very first uh, pathway that converts uh, dinitrogen or N2 into ammonium. This uh, reaction requires a lot of energy, but is the main source of nitrogen for most of these uh, microbial communities, as there's no abiotic sources here. Um, so a bottleneck or a lack of metals for this will impact the rest of the nitrogen cycle. And the, this pathway can rely on three different types of enzymes, which rely on either molybdenum, iron or vanadium. 
So what can the geochemistry tell us first? So we uh, can see what compounds are available for biology to use, uh, which redox reactions are favorable in these conditions. So oxidation reduction reactions that they can use to generate energy. Uh, for instance, do they have to be aerobic, anaerobic? Is oxygen required? Uh, are the electron donors or acceptors available for these um, redox couples? And can the communities use these reactions to create energy and support growth? Um, so I first looked at the availability of the metals related to nitrogen uh, cycling in the bedrock, um, because that's where the water is moving up through. And I wanted to see uh, how much of these metals would be available in both Earth rocks and Mars rocks. So I've included some Mars meteorite data in these plots as well. And um, for molybdenum, on the left, you can see that rhyolite actually contains a lot more than basalt. Um, and the Mars meteorite data kind of falls along lines along the lines of uh, similar levels as basalt. We know that Mars is mainly basaltic, so this makes sense. There's not any abnormalities there. Iron is a similar story uh, with, again, the meteorite data lining up with basalt. However, basalt tends to have more iron, uh, while rhyolite has a lot less. Um, you can see how they line up there. We also have some Mars basaltic soil. Uh, measured here, which is the only one I have, which is not a meteorite, I think. Uh, most of them are meteorites because we're unable to do a lot of in-situ measurements with the rovers, unfortunately. So next I moved on to thinking about the geochemical controls in the water on the availability of these metals. So I was able to do some statistical analyses on hot springs across uh, Earth that I collated into one big uh, data set. And what I'm looking at is which of these compounds and factors are positively correlated with each other. So any factors in this plot that are moving in a similar direction are positively correlated. Any that are moving in an opposite direction to each other are negatively correlated. And if they're, they're more of a right angle to each other, then there's not much correlation at all. I've also colored the points um, for bedrock type, just to give an idea for that as well. So what we see is that the trans most of the transition metals, um, like iron, vanadium and copper, are more soluble, soluble in acidic waters. You can see they're kind of going in opposite direction to pH, which means we tend to find more of them in environments with a lower pH. However, molybdenum is a weird exception. So it's actually uh, going in a similar direction to pH, which means it's more soluble in alkaline waters, which means that environments which favor molybdenum are not necessarily going to favor those other metals. And this might impact the nitrogen cycle here. We also found that bedrock and uh, these other factors didn't line up the same way. Um, you can see the most molybdenum rich samples up in the top right are actually basaltic. And we know that basalt contains a lot less molybdenum than rhyolite does. So what this tells us is that it's not necessarily about how much of these metals the rock has, it's about the leaching capability of the water moving through it. And if the water is acidic, it will not take any molybdenum regardless of how much molybdenum that rock has. So here's a nice summary of some of the controls on molybdenum specifically. You can see on the left, molybdenum against pH, and we can see, as expected, molybdenum is slightly higher in more alkaline samples. Sulfide is also something I found in the uh, literature to affect molybdenum as well, but in the opposite way. So higher levels of sulf sulfide, actually any above 0.5 milligrams per litre, tend to leach or scavenge molybdenum out of solution into sediments as thiamolybdates. This is seen in uh, past uh, anoxic ocean events on Earth, where the oceans became very eucinic, so sulfide-rich and anoxic, and the sediments suddenly became very, very enriched in molybdenum as it just became, just left the uh, water column. Um, and the third thing which impacts molybdenum is oxygen. Oxygen and molybdenum are very intrinsically related. We actually use molybdenum as an indicator for oxygen levels in our oceans. And so again, looking at molybdenum in sediments, we know anoxic ocean events um, happened because the molybdenum was uh, moving into the sediments a lot more. And as, as the oceans became more oxygenated over Earth's history, the Great Oxidation event, we saw higher levels of molybdenum in the oceans. And it's actually the most abundant metal in the oceans today. But what about Mars hot springs? Um, kind of what, what would they favour in terms of these metals? So from what we know um, about Mars hot springs, we've not been able to do a ton of research on them, but from what the rovers have been able to determine, we found some silica deposits, which are similar to the uh, picture here that I took of a kind of 
uh, dead or inactive hot spring in Iceland. Um, so silica deposits like this are created by acidic to neutral springs, which are rich in silica, chloride, and sulfate. So that's one thing we know about them. We also know basaltic bedrock means flows of be enriched in iron, magnesium, silica, and calcium. We know that degassing of volcanic gases would also lower the pH slightly. Um, and we know that uh, both, this, both the silica deposits and the fact that magmatic gas degassing and cooling would have been quicker means that hot springs on Mars actually would have been slightly cooler than those on Earth, so below 40 degrees Celsius. So about the perfect temperature to take a bath in. But overall, we think that the conditions would have been slightly less favourable for molybdenum and slightly more favourable for other metals. So what about my Icelandic hot springs? How similar are they? So we found mostly acidic to neutral waters, as you can see in this plot here, with pH and temperature. Uh, temperatures were mostly between 15 to 60 degrees, which agrees with Mars data as well. We found that they were rich in silica, chloride, iron, calcium, magnesium and sulfate, again agreeing with Mars data. We also detected uh, dissolved hydrogen sulfide along with CO2 dominating in most sites. Um, as you saw earlier, most of the sites we visited were basaltic or tholeitic, and again, we found it was unfavourable conditions for molybdenum. Here's the uh, major dissolved ions uh, that we measured from the geochemistry, and you can see the, uh, the dominating, dominating nature of those uh, compounds we mentioned earlier. Uh, things like iron are much more available in the more acidic sites, like Kristovic, um, but sulfate is generally quite uh, dominant in most sites. When we look at the minor ions, we see a lot more variability. Uh, we see sulfide on a lot of the sites, which again, we know affects molybdenum. If you look for molybdenum, you will not find it um, because it was below detection in every single site. Copper was also uh, lacking in most of the sites. However, we did find vanadium in quite a few of them in quite high abundances as well. Uh, talking about the nitrogen cycle as well, we measured nitrogen compounds like nitrate and ammonia. We did find them in a lot of the sites, but in very, quite low abundances. So in terms of the availability of metals for the nitrogen cycle, we found high concentrations of iron and a little bit of vanadium, but we think that any pathways which rely on molybdenum or copper will be inhibited in some sites. We also find low concentrations of those nitrogen compounds, which might be due to the fact that these organisms are incapable of producing these due to the metal unavailability, and there's also no bi abiotic sources, as far as we can tell, in these hot spring systems. We know that nitrogen fixation, as mentioned earlier, um, does usually rely on molybdenum. However, it has two alternative enzymes it can switch to when molybdenum is unavailable, uh, which rely on iron or vanadium as well. So that might be what's happening here. There we go. So moving on to stable isotopes, uh, which was the next analysis as part of my PhD. Um, so isotopes are when a element of the periodic table, uh, which has the same number of protons, if it is the same element, can have a variable number of neutrons in its nucleus, which means that they have slightly different weights. So for nitrogen, for example, it can have an atomic mass of 14, where it has seven protons, seven neutrons, or 15, where it has seven protons and eight neutrons. And these are very small differences, but it means that uh, there are slight chemical differences and uh, breaking the bonds of heavier isotopes takes slightly more energy than breaking the bonds of the lighter isotopes. So the amount of uh, the heavier isotope versus the lighter isotope in a, any given compound is the it's given through a delta value, which is that kind of one that looks like a squiggly D. Um, there, when a process uh, uses a compound and changes it into another one, either abiotic or biotic, Sometimes it'll favour one isotope over the other, and it'll give a product with a different ratio of the lighter and the heavier isotopes than the substrate it was it, it acted on. And the difference in these is called the fractionation effect. Biology in particular favours the lighter isotopes and usually does this. So we end up with, in the instance of nitrogen, more 14N over 15N, and a lighter and more negative delta 15N value versus the product, the substrate, sorry. So what can stable isotopes tell us? So we can use these as a biosignature, i.e. a sign of life, because we know that biology favors the lighter isotopes. And on top of this, we can actually link them to specific biological pathways because there are distinct differences in the fractionation effects of different pathways. This has been done on Earth as well. 
We know nitrogen is cycled almost exclusively by biology and Earth's surface, so many perturbations on this cycle are usually due to biology. And we would assume that any sort of life elsewhere in the universe would, would um, require at least some of the same elements and would cycle them in a way that was different from the environment around it. And we can also use biosignature isotopes for uh, other biogeochemical cycles as a biosignature. You can see the uh, range of the different uh, fractionation effects for different nitrogen pathways here on the right. And I plotted my isotope data from my hot springs against this to see if I could predict which pathways were happening. So this is the bulk biomass and bulk sediment of these sites. And you can see that they kind of fall uh, between kind of zero and minus 10 uh, per mil. So that falls in line with quite a few different metabolisms, but there's a few that we can rule out based on the geochemistry. So there's very little nitrate in these sites. Um, and because of uh, the fact that uh, nitrification, which is a pathway that they can use to produce nitrate, is, uh, in, in, is uh, unable to happen due to the lack of uh, the metals required for both of these pathways. We think that nitrate and nitrate assimilation and uh, production of these compounds is unlikely to be happening in these sites. So because of this, we think that the um, with a combination of the geochemical data and the isotopes that the main pathways these or, um, microorganisms are using is nitrogen fixation and then assimilation. So they're basically going from N2 to ammonium and then uptaking it into their cells. So they're not using it for any of the other pathways which should, would generate energy. They're simply doing it to gain nitrogen to build their cells with. So if you look down a little bit more in detail at this area, you can see that those um, different nitrogen fixation enzymes actually have different fractionation effects. And this is because the molybdenum one is actually more efficient and produces a much smaller fractionation effect than the two alternative ones. So in these sorts of sites where we have uh, less molybdenum, we might see some sites favoring these ones instead. And when we look at the geochemistry of these sites, uh, the ones which fall within the molybdenum nitrogenase range are sites which favor molybdenum geochemically a little more in the water. And those with a more negative delta 15N value are actually sites where molybdenum solubility is much lower. So they have a low pH, high sulfide, or low dissolved oxygen. So while molybdenum is below detection in each site, it might actually still be slightly available enough for some sites to use it for nitrogen fixation. So next, moving on to the biology part of this, which is unfortunate, I know, but it's a big part of my PhD, so I'm going to talk about it. So what can metagenomics tell us? So a genome is all of the genes of a single organism. Uh, a human has their own genome. My little microbes in my hot springs have their own genome. And we can look at the DNA of a single organism and it'll tell us what the organism can do. So if you look at metagenomics, which are the genomes of an entire community of microbes, it tells us what the community is able to do. So it gives us an idea of their functional potential, i.e. which biochemical reactions can take place. And in terms of the nitrogen pathway, I'm able to see even different nitrogen pathways are able to take place. So if we find the genes for a certain enzyme, then we know that that pathway is capable of happening and that can be complete. So we can use metagenomic data to confirm hypotheses that we created by the geochemical data so that when we go to Mars and we don't have the biological data anymore, we know what the geochemistry is telling us. So uh, my results, so what pathways were complete in these modern hot springs and how do these microbes use nitrogen? So it kind of looks like this. So a lot simpler than the nitrogen cycle. So the only two pathways which were complete in every site were nitrogen fixation and ammonia assimilation, which is what we predicted from the isotopic data. We also have some isotopes suggesting that the molybdenum independent enzymes are favored, and we did find those in most sites as well. Um, we find that other pathways are inhibited by the lack of molybdenum, copper as well, uh, the reducing conditions and low levels of dissolved nitrogen. So how do these energies communities produce energy. If they're not using nitrogen to produce energy, what are they using and what would they use on Mars? So there's a couple of different things that they might be able to use and we actually found these metabolisms present in the metagenomic data. So there's quite a few oxidation and reduction pathways using hydrogen, iron, sulfur and um, carbon. 
All of these compounds are re readily available in these environments. And you can couple uh, oxidation pathways and reduction pathways together. So one of them can fuel the other. And these can be used to create energy and have been shown to support growth in microbial communities within hot springs. So these are the sorts of things that these microbes might be using in these hot springs and what they might have used on Mars. So to summarize, um, Icelandic hot springs exert similar geochemical pressures to those that we expect to see in Noachian Age Mars hot springs. And these pressures limit nitrogen cycling pathways due to the lack of bioavailable molybdenum and copper as well. Um, so primitive microbial processes uh, during early Mars history would likely have relied on other biocentral elements to produce energy, such as sulfur, iron, carbon, and hydrogen. And nitrogen would be assimilated instead of used for energy production. But this still produces really distinctive isotopic signatures that we can use to predict what the biology is doing and use as a really uh, strong biosignature. So what does this mean for future Mars missions? So the Mars sample return mission will allow for more in-depth analyses of Martian surface materials, including stabilized top analysis, which I am gunning for. Um, but if we understand the geochemical conditions these samples were collected in uh, and generated in, it gives new context to the isotopic data and allows us to tell the difference between abiotic signatures and possible life. Hopefully I've shown that nitrogen isotopes have been uh, can be used to record record biological processes accurately in analog sites when combined with its geochemical conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. That's, uh, I was really carried along by your enthusiasm there, and that was fascinating. It's a really nice illustration of how uh, geology and biology are kind of not only intimately connected but influence each other as well so that's uh, that's, that's a great lesson for all of us um uh, david do you want to how do you want to handle this with the just put questions onto the chat i think people can unmute them so, uh, yeah um let's just uh stop the screen share for a minute uh, okay yeah of course um that's fine. Um, I think people just unmute themselves and and and, put their, and just say they want to say a question. And I can start with a question. Go on then. Uh, I thought one of the, well, naively, know know nothing about the top topic, but uh, I thought phosphorus was an essential ingredient of life on Earth. Is it? Is that? Is that part of your study? Um, yeah, it is one of the like chinops elements um yes. phosphorus and um, yeah i have measured phosphorus in my site um it isn't a limiting nutrient there's enough of it there to support the community and in terms of phosphorus on mars we have also detected sufficient levels to support uh, life over there as well but is it an essential ingredient or can life exist yes. without phosphorus as far as we're aware no it is an essential ingredient it's actually used to create dna so yes. um Life so as we know phosphorus, it, at least. You could have life. If you have no phosphorus, you presumably can't have life as we know it. Is that right? Uh, as, as, assuming so, um, I don't know. We don't know for sure, but assuming that some of, uh, most of the elements were the same, they would need some kind of source of phosphorus, yeah. And there's a point, I, just a, fit, a, fit, a sort of comment, that was, uh, it sounds like nitrogen uh, isotopes are quite crucial. I mean, they tend to be, you cannot seem to get that fractionation without life. Yeah? Yeah, um, I have looked into kind of abiotic uh, fractionations in nitrogen and they never mimic what life does. Mm. Um, they can fractionate it in the opposite direction. So there might be some situations where they can either imprint over or mimic or but they will never mimic it. So those kind of negative fractionations are inherent to life on Earth, at least. And, so, so. and can perseverance sampling even remote sampling can it measure nitrogen isotopes or, or does it have to wait for sample return it's incapable right now um there have been a lot of models uh that tried to figure out what mars's kind of nitrogen atmosphere used to look like um and the the thing with isotopes is that their their absolute values will be totally different out on mars so it'll have like plus 300 comparison to what we would see here on Earth. Mm. But it's about like showing that there is a change, like a fractionation effect rather than absolute values as well. Okay, all right. Over to somebody else. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, would anybody else like to chip in with a question? Just unmute yourself and uh, shout out. Thank you, everyone in the chat. That's really nice. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just I just remembered how to open that up, so I've seen it now. So thanks <laughs> for those comments, or well, Tony. Uh, I'll, I'll, I have a, a question. So when you're looking at analog sites um, on on two planets with different masses and gravitational fields and different atmospheric total and partial pressures for different things. Um, it, it seems you, you find lots of similarities with what, what should be there on Mars, but, but do they influence things? I mean, there's a much higher partial pressure of oxygen. There's a higher total pressure. How are they likely to influence um, the results and, and kind of um, play down the similarities with Mars? Do they yeah. create any problems for you? Um, in terms of microbial processes, they don't tend to impact them too much, uh, luckily. Um, and we also know that Mars's early atmosphere was very reducing, so mostly CO2 and nitrogen, which is nothing weird or, or you know, it's actually really similar to early Earth. Um, and it, Another difference in the hot springs in terms of how they're formed is a lot of them on Mars are impact generated. There were some impact generated ones on Earth too, but ones that are created by impacts are actually slightly different to those that are like indigenous and fueled by internal volcanism. So that's another thing I've been considering and considering in terms of how quickly they cool, how stable they are. Um, you know, these hot springs change over time uh, very easily. So I'm also looking into how stable they would be over geological time periods as well mm. okay so yeah that's that's a, a, a rather different sort of process to the ones I, I guess you're you're selecting places deliberately that are anoxic as well so that's sort of yeah. looking for looking for similarities uh, yeah okay uh oh what's somebody saying we are we going to have some weather <laughs> okay and oh. it's going to get us going to get as cold as mars tonight uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, any any other questions? Just uh, I have, an, I have another. Question. I have another wee question. Um, Go on then. I mean, Tony, I bet you're probably not a betting person, but what's your feeling for life on Mars and Europa and places like that? You must have a a gut feeling as to what what really is out there. Currently, um, I think currently Mars isn't super habitable. There are some people that suggest that there could be subsurface pockets of water um, where if life first evolved on the surface, it could have moved underground as Mars lost its atmosphere. So I'm not ruling that out. However, I am partial to the icy moons because they're literal, just huge, just ocean worlds. Um, and I, I think my money would be on them for current life right now. For current life, yeah. But you think Mars... Yeah. Your, your analog work has shown that the, the the hot springs in Iceland are similar to what hot springs would have been like four billion years ago on Mars. So there's a good chance, yeah. Yeah, and the the period in which Mars was uh, habitable was long enough for simple life to appear. It, it that kind of time period was how long it took on Earth. So there would have been enough time for at least simple life to evolve. Yeah, I know that. Um, Obviously, some of the sample return is really going to tell us a bit more about Mars, but the, the Perseverance was going down Jezero Crater around the Delta, and people were saying, oh, maybe we'll see stromatolites and things like that. Have you? And they're like, it's all gone quiet. So presumably they haven't seen anything that would be identifiable you know, unequivocally as stromatolite. But what are you, you've been following the mission more than I have. Can you just give us yeah. a summary of what it's been seeing? I'm really, we haven't found Stromatolite, so I'm really sorry. Oh, no. um, we, <laughs> we have found a really, a lot of really cool lake deposits. Um, and some of them suggest that the lakes were anoxic as well, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a lot of uh, more uh, sedimentary work that's done as Percy goes, because it's a lot easier to do as uh, kind of sedimentary structure or structural geology from just like mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah. Um, than it is for anything else. So uh, I have uh, other PhDs I know who are at Imperial who are currently working on uh, the sedimentology of the delta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but no, no wavy stromatolites, no. 
No, unfortunately not. Sorry. <laughs> there is Wouldn't evidence of great? tides. There is evidence of tides at the edge of the lake, though. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay. okay there's uh, some questions on the chat there, Simon. Yeah. Yeah, questions I can the see chat. them. So yeah, that's that's, that's fine. Uh, that was the longest short question I ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> but a really interesting. Um, so Colin uh, has a mm -hmm. question uh, about enzymes. Do you want to unmute and ask it, or shall I ask it? Okay, he, he says, what makes you think Martian life will use the same enzymic pathways? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not assuming that Martian life will have DNA the same that we do. I'm not assuming it'll have enzymes like we do. But what I am assuming is that if there was life on Mars, A, it used similar compounds to we do that we do, and B, it left an imprint in those compounds and their chemical structure that we can distinguish from abiotic processes. So it's more about showing that there's a link between the isotopes and life than um, kind of, uh, but it's cool that we can link it to specific pathways as well. That's great for Earth studies as well. Um, but just kind of proving that nitrogen isotopes would be a really useful biosignature. But thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Polly, oh, Mr. Fleming has got a question. Yeah, I got here. Yeah, I, I got him as well. So, but I have one from Polly. Is Polly? Can you shout out, or shall I read this out? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the there talk, Polly. Um, my question was: Have you been able to look at any hot springs? You showed a picture of uh, an inactive one. But have you been able to look at any from like? deeper in Earth's past that might be, show how these markers might have changed over time? Yes, um, I haven't been looking at ancient hot springs on Earth, uh, but I am aware of that. And that would be kind of a, a post PhD um, project possibly. And um, I would like to test these hypotheses on ancient Earth deposits to see if we can um, kind of use them as signs of life perhaps in systems or hot spring deposits that we didn't think had life before. Um, we have used nitrogen isotopes to uh, confidently detect when nitrogen fixation first evolved on Earth. Um, it wasn't hot spring deposits that they used, as far as I'm aware, but um, at least in some sort of ancient Earth deposits, they've been able to use these. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks for that one. Uh, Alistair, Alistair Fleming uh, has put one on the chat here. I, I think his, um, his mute is stuck off. So no, I'll, I I'll, I think I'll read it out. Somebody's unmuted me. Oh, good. Okay, ask oh. away. Hi, yeah. Alistair. Well, hello there. Uh, just wondering which nitrogen isotope ratio you, you're using as baseline. Standard atmospheric uh, percentage, which reflects, of course, where it is on a modern world with a lot of photosynthetic stuff going on and a lot of nitrogen recirculation going on, or what has been down uh, down on the mid-ocean ridge and down to depth and come up again in the outgassing, which possibly by the time it gets back up is different ratio. Yeah, um, so for my isotopic analysis, I used atmospheric nitrogen as yes. the universal standard. However, we did also measure uh, the delta 15 of dissolved into in my waters just to make yeah. sure it wasn't too far off of that. Um, we did find that it it's it sat around between zero and minus two per mil, um, yeah. which did increase some of the isotope fractionation effects slightly, but didn't change any of the hypotheses that we had. Right. Um, but we did, yeah. But we did cover our bases with that. I think some of it would be a little bit of magmatic nitrogen. Yes, it's just wondering what's going on at depth when it's going mm -hmm. down at the mid-ocean ridge. It could yes. be quite, uh, subject to quite a bit of change. Definitely. There are other researchers at St Andrews that actually study nitrogen in the mantle. Um, yeah. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't know too much about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I know we, it has a slightly different isotopic signature to atmospheric nitrogen, so we did consider that as well. 
I mean, we do ignore, tend to ignore the fact that the nitrogen cycle goes on and down as far as the mantle. It's not just something at the uh, surface. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, Thank uh, you very much. Oh, I was, th thanks, Alistair. Uh, I was, I was going to ask a question kind of related to that. Um, you, you nearly put me off by saying you don't know much about the mental side of it, but uh, I'm going to persevere anyway. But um, so, of course, when we're breathing our air in and out, it's mostly nitrogen mm. that's going in and out. And we don't even notice it. Um, so, so there's a very big nitrogen partial pressure in the atmosphere. I mean, um, I, I don't really know much about what it was like on the early Earth or, or on Mars. Uh, in, in early Mars, because Mars has a very lo low nitrogen proportion in its atmosphere at the moment, doesn't it? The same as Venus. Um, so, and, and Earth is weird because it has this very high nitrogen. So, what what was what was the main source of nitrogen? And uh, um, then, do you think? And and uh, you know, how much of it would there have been compared with Earth? Because it's it 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 may not have been. Um, as important in the metabolism as as uh, as as you started off by saying, but uh, nevertheless, it must be significant. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so, on Earth, in terms of going back through evolution of life, we have the Luca, the last universal common ancestor, which was kind of the one life form that we can uh, that every living organism today is related to. So there was one cell like three and a half billion years ago that went on to make every single kind of life that's happening now. And we've been able to trace back through like biological clocks to find out the nitrogen fixation was present in that organism. So we know it evolved so early in Earth's history that it was such a keystone metabolism that they had to evolve it very quickly. In terms of Mars and uh, Mars's kind of nitrogen uh, reservoirs. Uh, there have been models uh, which have looked at how quickly Mars lost its atmosphere and how much nitrogen it has currently and the isotopic fractionation of that. And we've used models to kind of reverse it um, back to what early Mars would have had. And it would have actually had an atmosphere very, very rich in nitrogen um, mm. around the Noachian period. So there wow. would have been a lot of it available in the atmosphere at least. That's astonishing. I never, I, I never <laughs> knew that. That, that, that's, uh, and presumably the atmosphere was a fair bit denser than it is now as well. So the total amount would be quite high. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it was, yeah. This, this Mars's mantle is it as ox oxidized as Earth's, or that that's the next one of the explanations for a lot of nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere. I think sometimes not just life, yeah. but uh, yeah. Okay, I'll stop rabbiting on about that now. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, from the audience. Uh, I've got one, I've got one um, James Lovelock type question. It's a bit old fashioned now, this stuff, isn't it? But anyway, um, so if there was a lot of microbial life in early Mars history, uh, the environments look right, um, then you start having to think about the influence of those things on the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere um, and also the retention of liquid water at the right temperature or maybe goes the other way and there's a loss of it. So is anybody thinking about the, the these kind of um, um, geomicrobiological uh, climatic effects for early Mars? Um. I'm not for early Mars, no. However, my supervisor at Manchester, uh, Professor Nixon, um, our group here is mainly focused on using microbes in hot springs and other extreme environments mm -hmm. that naturally fix CO2 out of the atmosphere into more useful products as a climate mediator, like biomediator. Yep. Um, and we're looking into kind of the feasibility of that on Earth. To, as a carbon storage or carbon capture um, method. Uh, so we're focusing more on organisms that don't convert CO2 into methane, which is a worse greenhouse gas, mm. but those that convert CO2 into less harmful, possibly more useful things. Um, but we 
think that processes like carbon fixation would have been entirely feasible on early Mars as well. Half of my PhD is actually on carbon as well as nitrogen. I've just okay. been buried, yeah. head buried in nitrogen for the past year. So that was what I discussed. Um, I have been looking at carbon and carbon isotopes as well. It's just like a little bit more of a complicated process um, than the nitrogen cycle is. But we think that carbon fixation, possibly into methane, could have been possible as well. Oh, that's so. That's fascinating because that would have an effect on the on the um, cl climate warming or cooling or thermostatic effects, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So when you've done the carbon bit, you'll have to come back and tell us all about that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Happy to. Uh, uh, we've had lots of nice uh, comments about your presentation. So uh, thank so, you. Uh, thanks very much for that. And I think uh, I'll um, ask Ian to give you a little vote of thanks. Tony, uh, on behalf of the Society, I'd uh, really like to thank you for your fantastic lecture. Uh, very professional, very uh, assured performance. Uh, I think we all enjoyed the geology, the chemistry, the biology, the mix, the, the mixing of the old, the ancient, with the here and now, pers the perseverance mission in the future, what the results are. and, and, and interweaving and, and interplaying all these things to basically almost come up with a fingerprint of what you hope to find from Mars or maybe even more so from uh, uh, Europa, the icy moons in, in the solar system. And I think it's fair to say, I mean, you've seen the, 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 the questions, you've certainly piqued the, uh, the interest of the, of the audience. And I think I'd probably echo Simon that um, you've kind of piqued your interest with the nitrogen now. Well, I think we probably will be looking for that sequel in carbon. So I'd like to think you will be in a position maybe sometime in the next year or two perhaps come back and give us part two of the story. Um, and I, would, I certainly, for one, would, would look forward to that. So I'd like to say thank you very, very much for your performance tonight, for your talk. Was very very appreciated, um, and on behalf of the society, normally we would give claps, but I don't know how we do it on Zoom. Oh, I can see you can one. Unmute, unmute us, David, and let us all have a go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, oh, very well done, and thank you. you very much. <laughs>